Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, time to move on now to Chapter 7, Species Interactions, Ecological Succession, and Population Control. All right, so we're going to talk about a bunch of different topics uh, in this lesson uh, or this lecture. Once again, I'm going to break this lecture down into two parts. There are 46 slides. Uh, I think I do 21 slides uh, in the first, uh, first lesson, and then there'll be 25 slides in Part 2. All right, so we'll get to it right now. Again, Species Interactions, Ecological succession and population control. This is chapter seven. Okay, now let's move on here. First page, core case study, talking about the southern sea otter, a, a species in recovery. So uh, again, this is one of these good uh, good news uh, environmental uh, science stories uh, that I like to highlight. So these sea otters live in giant kelp forests uh, on the Pacific coast or off the Pacific coast. Uh, they were almost hunted to extinction by the early 1900s, but they have now had a partial recovery since they were listed as endangered species uh, in 1977. Why do we care about sea otters? Well, they are a keystone species uh, to their environment, uh, ethics, obviously, and, and tourism dollars, as uh, people like to see those sea otters. Uh, so again, this are our reasons why we care. So uh, Science Focus 5.2 talks about the future of California's southern sea otters. Again, factors uh, in declining uh, their population, increased predatory predation by orcas, which are uh, whales, toxic algae and pollutants that are released into the ocean by human activities. Uh, they have a low reproductive rate as it is, so that uh, unfortunately uh, they don't have as many offspring as quickly um, and they have those rising mortality rates. Other threats, oil spills, fishing traps. And again, though, the otter population has been rising uh, in the last several years. Uh, thankfully, because of the uh, mitigation efforts uh, that we have enacted off the coast of California. So here is that little guy, our southern sea otter, uh, on the left there, uh, using a stone to actually crack open a, a clamshell. So actually uh, using technology, believe it or not, these sea otters, uh, because again, a stone, they're using a tool, and that 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 is that is a, a crude form of technology. Uh, and where do they live? They live in these kelp beds. Uh, you'll notice them on the right side there. I uh, don't know if any of you have been out to California. California, I've had the chance to actually go snorkeling off of Santa Catalina Island, uh, uh, Catalina Island, which is uh, just off the coast of LA. Uh, and that was awesome seeing those kelp uh, forests underneath the water as you snorkel above them. Uh, pretty fun stuff. So maybe one day you'll have a chance to do that as well. So uh, Science Focus 7.1 talks about threats to those kelp forests. Uh, giant kelp anchor to the seafloor uh, and grow towards the surface. They're fast growing. Uh, they're resistant to storm and wave damage, and they support many marine plants and animals. Uh, sea urchins prey on kelp plants. The southern sea otter helps control the sea urchin population and ecosystems, again, threatened by pollutants and climate change. So again, looking at these science focuses on the, the sea otter and, and the kelp forest, uh, just a way to kind of work into this unit uh, on species interactions. And that's what we're going to talk about first. So how do species interact? Well, species are going to interact in basically... Uh, uh, there are five types of species interactions that affect resource use and species population. Those are competition, predation, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism, all right? And we're going to talk about all five of these uh, in more detail uh, in this part one of our, uh, our chapter seven lesson. All right, so Competition for resources. The most common interaction between species is competition. Uh, so we have a couple of different types of competition. Uh, one, interspecific competition. This has been competition between different species that use the same limited resources. So, so what would this be? Uh, this would be maybe like uh, human beings to maybe lions, right? Both of us want to eat that antelope, right, for, 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 for dinner. Uh, human beings hunt it the antelope. Lions hunt the antelope. That is a form of interspecific competition. Competition between different species, the human beings and the lions, that use the same limited resources in those antelopes. Okay, So that's one type of competition. The other type of competition is called resource partitioning. This occurs when different species evolve specialized traits that allow them to share the same resources. So species may only 
use parts of a resource. They may use them in a different way. They may use them in, in, at different times, all right? But this is a way uh, uh, that evolution, natural selection, has allowed a competition for resources uh, among uh, a species, but they actually evolve traits that allow them to share the same resources. So the example is the uh, insect-eating warbler. This is a uh, bird that is found uh, in many places, uh, mainly though in the forests of Maine. And what, I I what we're talking about here is these are one, two, three, four, five different species of this insect-eating warbler. And what they've evolved to do to share resources is all five of them hunt for insects in the exact same tree. However, the black Bernian warbler only hunts where you see the yellow, so on the outside of the tree and right at the top. The black throated green warbler only hunts in the middle here, okay, of the tree. The Cape May warbler only hunts at the tippy top of the tree. The bay breasted one, kind of in the middle. The yellow rump warbler at the bottom of the tree. So what has happened here, you have different species, okay, uh, they're, they're all warblers, but they're different species within, within that, uh, within the warbler family, and they have this resource, resource partitioning, or they basically evolve to partition off the resources so that they all can survive on this in this one tree, right? Because they're eating insects at different levels of the tree, at different locations, okay? And this is an example of that resource partitioning. Uh, here's another example. Uh, these are different species of honey creepers, uh, which have evolved um, to, uh, with specialized beaks to share resources. They only eat certain types of insects, seeds, fruits, and nectars from certain flowers. So you can imagine, right, this guy up here, right? Really long beak. So it must get nectar from a flower that you have to go way down into to get the nectar, right? So you have the uh, insect and nectar eaters, right? So this guy back here, the, the apaney, right? Whatever flower it's getting, the, the flower, the nectar isn't that far down, right? So its beak isn't, isn't as long. Uh, here you have your fruit and seed eaters on the left side here. Again, this guy here with that beak is going to eat a different type of seed or fruit than let's say the greater koa finch up here that again has a different, uh, a different type of beak. So uh, once again, this resource partitioning, evolving uh, different species in a way that allows them to share the, the same resources or use or share the same area and use resources in that environment. And this is a way that evolution uh, has allowed for these creatures, these organisms to have competition for resources, but have allowed them to survive uh, by, again, partitioning off uh, some of the resources. All right. So that's number one, competition. And again, that's the most common form of interaction between species. Uh, second type of interaction we're going to talk about is predation. Uh, predation, I'm sure you know about. This is the predator and the prey. The predator feeds directly on all or part of a member of another species, which we call the prey. Uh, strong effect on population sizes and other factors in ecosystems. So there are a bunch of different methods of predation, walk, fly, swim, um, camouflage, chemical warfare. Okay, these are all uh, ways that predators have or prey have evolved with one another. Now, prey species evolve in ways to avoid predators, right? So you have to understand that prey and predators are evolving together, right? Uh, as the predator uh, evolves in a way that allows it to uh, catch more prey, the prey is evolving in a way to allow it to not be caught. By the, by the predators. And that continues on and on and on in this kind of like arms race, you can sign it, kind of say, between the predator and the prey. So some ways that prey species have evolved to avoid predators, camouflage, chemical warfare, warning colors, mimicry, and different behavioral strategies. So for instance, here we have a brown bear eating a salmon, kind of your basic predator-prey relationship, right? The brown bear is the predator, the salmon is the prey, and pretty much the predator eats the prey. Now, in this picture here, this shows us those different 
uh, ways that the prey has come up with to try to avoid the predator, right? So in A and B, the span worm and the wandering leaf insect, they use camouflage, right, to kind of blend into their surroundings. Uh, when we look at C, D, and E here, this is the bombardier beetle, the foul-tasting monarch butterfly, and the poison dart uh, frog. They have uh, established chemical warfare. So these three uh, these three prey actually release a chemical that makes it not too pleasant to eat them, right? Then you look at uh, D, E, and F, right? So we have the monarch butterfly, the dart fly, and the, the visceral butterfly. Um, they have these bright colors that basically are warning colors that say to predators, don't eat me, I taste bad or I'm toxic, right? Then you have F, mimicry, all right? So in F, the visceral butterfly mimics the monarch butterfly, which, which tastes foul, the viscera butterfly really doesn't taste foul, but predators think that it's the monarch butterfly and so stay away from it. You have G, deceptive tactics. The hard wings of this moth resemble the eyes of a much larger animal. So the prey has evolved to try to deceive the predator uh, by putting these things that look like eyes on, on the back of the or, the, or the wings, the hind wings of this moth. And then you have deceptive behavior, right? When touched, the snake caterpillar changes shape to look like the head of a snake. It's deceptive, but it's evolved so that the predator stays away from it. Um, so again, these are your relationships between the predator and the prey. And we're going to talk more about this when we get to uh, agriculture, because this is why you want to not use pesticides to kill the kill pest. You want to use actual living creatures, because we talked about how the pesticides, when you spray them on insects, right, the insects, because they reproduce so rapidly, eventually real quickly evolve to uh, basically not be killed by that pesticide. Well, if you put in an, an, an organism that eats the insects, as the insects evolve to avoid that organism, that organism itself is evolving to continue to eat the prey, and therefore you have a better chance of keeping that insect or that pest population down versus using pesticides which aren't evolving with the, with the prey, which are the insects. All right, so something to think about, and again, more on that when we get into, uh, get into agriculture. So. This is basically now a kind of talking about what I just spoke about uh, for the past couple of minutes, uh, this co-evolution, that predation plays a role in natural selection. Animals with better defenses against predation tend to leave more offspring, right? So if you're a prey, but your defenses are better, you're going to leave more offspring, okay? But this then leads to co-evolution because then the predator says, all right, well, now I need to evolve in order to eat or prey on the prey that has now evolved better defenses, right? So this arms race, as we call it, kind of quote unquote in the, in the natural world continues. Changes in the gene pool of one species can cause changes in the gene pool of another. So the example here are bats and moths. The e echolocation of bats, right? Bats can use sonar to find where they are or to uh, basically find their prey. Moths, which are their prey, have, ev have evolved very sensitive hearing to almost sense or hear when those bats are trying to find them, right? So again, this is the predator-prey relationship in this co-evolution, all right? So very important uh, when we talk about species interactions uh, is that predator and that prey relationship. All right, the last three we're going to talk about, not as important as the first two, but still are out there and still you need to know about them, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. So what is parasitism? Well, that's when one species a parasite lives on another organism. However, the parasites harm but rarely kill the host. And think about that, okay? That is, is a part of evolution. If you're a parasite and you kill your host, well, then you're going to die yourself, right? Because you need the host to live. So parasites have evolved to harm the host but rarely kill them because that wouldn't be good for the parasite itself, okay? So examples, tapeworms, sea lampreys, fleas, ticks, 
Okay, these are examples of parasites, right? Your dog gets a tick or you get a tick or your dog gets fleas. Your dog isn't going to die from fleas, right? It's just annoying to the dog. It may harm the dog a little bit. The ticks, you know, may give us Lyme disease or something like that. Uh, but you rarely die from a tick bite. Um, it, it's just that they, they harm you, but again, rarely kill the host. So uh, what is this a picture of? This is a uh, basically a trout. Uh, this is an adult lake trout in the Great Lakes, and that's a sea lamprey that has attached itself to the trout. It will suck this, uh, the trout's blood. It will take other nutrients out, out off of the trout, but it will not kill the trout because, again, if it did, then it dies itself. Okay, so that isn't a good uh, evolutionary tactic of a parasite uh, to kill its host. Next is called mutualism. This is when an interaction between uh, species benefits both the species. Nutrition and protective relationships are usually how this works. But what's important to understand about mutualism is this is not cooperation. Okay, this is not two organisms saying we're going to cooperate together to kind of help each other out. It's mutual exploitation of one another. All right, so that's very important when you think about mutualism. It's not cooperation. They're mutually exploiting one another, these two species that are interacting, okay, but the interaction benefits both species, unlike parasitism, where it only benefits the one, the parasite. So some example, uh, one example here is a clownfish living within the sea anemones. The clownfish lives within the sea anemones, gaining protection and feeding on the waste matter left by the sea anemones. However, that's how the, that's how the, uh, uh, that's how the clownfish are, are benefited. How are the, how is the, uh, the anemones benefited? Well, the clownfish protect them from some predators and parasites, right? The uh, predator comes for the uh, sea anemone, sees the clownfish, moves away. So again, they're not necessarily cooperating the clownfish and the sea anemone, but they're exploiting one another in a mutual way that is positive for both species. Okay, that is the definition of mutualism. And here's another uh, example. These are oxpeckers uh, that feed on ticks that infect the impala. So what's happening here? The oxpeckers uh, are getting protection from the impala, while the impala are getting its ticks removed by the oxpeckers, and the oxpeckers then eat the ticks. So again, it's a win-win situation for both species. That is the definition of mutualism. Final one is commensalism. Uh, this is when uh, it benefits one species, the interaction between the two species, and has little effect on the other one. So again, parasites or parasitism benefits one, harms the other. Mutualism helps both species. Commensalism helps one doesn't really do anything to the other, kind of neutral to the other. So the example are epiphytes, which are air plants that attach themselves to trees uh, and birds that nest in trees, right? Uh, the, the birds nesting in a tree, that uh, that that uh, helps the birds, right? Uh, they need a place to nest and to raise their young. It doesn't really affect a tree in, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. So it just helps the birds. It doesn't really affect the tree. Uh, that is a uh, commensalism. Epiphytes, these air plants, they basically don't have roots. They attach themselves to trees. We see a lot of these in tropical rainforests. Uh, and they just hang out on the tree and live. They don't eat the tree or, or take any nutrients from the tree, so they're not parasites. Uh, so they live on the tree, which helps them. The tree gets nothing in return, negative or positive. Uh, and again, that is the definition of commensalism. So uh, your final one here, this is a pitcher plant. Okay, which is one of these epiphytes. Uh, they're attached to the branch of a tree. Again, they don't penetrate or harm the tree. They just hang there, uh, but it affects them because what do they do? They are, are, they are a form of a carnivorous plant. So insects, they feed on insects that, that fall into the plant and there's a liquid down there and then they ingest the insects. Uh, so again, they live on these trees. They're not, uh, they're not harming the tree, but it's good for them to live there. And that's the definition of commensalism. All right. So those are the five ways that species are going to interact. Uh, and that also are the main five ways that species interact uh, out there in the world. Uh, and that's going to be the end of part one of my lecture on chapter seven, species interaction, ecological succession, and population control. Coming up in part two, we'll talk more about that ecological succession, and we'll talk more about popula population control then. So uh, I look forward to seeing you then. And as always, thanks for listening.